Back in 1996, Mark and I began work on our doctorates with a pilgrimage to Wales, studying at St. Daniel's Library, which was in the home of Sir William Gladstone, and we would take day trips to places specifically and uniquely special to Celtic Christianity. And while we were there, we learned about thin places, those places in the world, in our lives, where God seems particularly close, the veil between heaven and earth particularly thin. And we visited sacred sites, places shrouded in misty dampness. It was Wales, after all. Old churches with rich history and mysticism. One of our favorite places was called Penant Malanga, which was a shrine dedicated to a nun who was said to be the patron saint of hares. That's his rabbit kinds of hares. And it was a beautiful and mysterious place. And I have to say, the minute we stepped off the bus, we felt that we were in a holy place. Now, we all have thin places in our lives, sacred spaces. And part of what we need to be doing as followers of Jesus is paying more attention to those places, to where God is dwelling and blessing and participating. So something as simple as lighting a candle during devotional time or prayer time or something as complex as making a pilgrimage to a special spot can help point us toward God at work in our lives and in our world. Now, the importance of creating those kinds of places has everything to do with intention, much like how the tabernacle-carrying Jews in the Torah built their traveling holy place to, with intention whenever they found a place where God's cloud would descend and they would hammer their tent pegs into the ground. And creating a space with intention also has significant mental health benefits. We all know how the color of walls um, can affect our moods. For instance, did you know that fast food restaurants almost always paint their places in primary vivid colors? That's to get you in and out of there quickly. They don't want you relaxing and settling in. Um, but altars can be set up. We learned about this when we saw uh, the movie Coco, and we learned about ofrendas and ways that we can remember and honor those who have passed on before us that help us to aid in the grieving process. But this space that we make for our spiritual journey creates a sense of the sacred for our spirits and facilitates an experience of wholeheartedness and well-being for our minds and bodies. Theologian Ruth Haley Barton says, being intentional to look for and enter into the sacredness of little altars all day long invites us to be in the presence of, to experience the one we cherish. And we are freed from the need to devise thoughts about God or challenge God about proper ideas of belief. God just wants to be with us like a parent who just wants to enjoy their child. Now, who doesn't want to notice when they are in the presence of God? We have this inner longing for sacred spaces and places. We might say that it's a God characteristic of being human. So we search for those special places, those unique experiences and situations where we can experience God in a palpable way. So our two psalm texts for today, um, in those we see all of that at work. Sacred spaces, unique experiences, experiencing God. In Psalm 112, this is a psalm of praise extolling the righteous who find themselves somehow constantly in the presence of God. And we find how the blessings of God dwell in those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. 
So in this psalm, we find this sense of security, not necessarily where one is located physically, but where one's heart is located in worship and praise of God. Now, the world can be a pretty dark place, as the psalmist makes clear in plenty of places in that psalm. But he says, the blessed light up the world, which is just what Jesus preaches when he admonishes us to be that light of the world. It's that light that we light each time we read the scriptures or talk about God in our sacred space right now. And Psalm 112 attributes that sort of world illuminating light to the righteous keeper of the commands. She shines with God's own light and lights up a dark world. So we might actually think of Psalm 112 as sort of an extended beatitude. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who delight in God's commandments, who are gracious, merciful, and righteous, who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice, who have given to the poor. Maybe some of us can even relate to the minister who recalls the numerous times people have fought over personal experience versus sacred space. There are always budget fights. Should we feed the poor or fix the roof? And it's, it's a difficult binary all the time. But, but uh, one, this minister argues it's not really a binary. It's not an either or, but rather a nested event. The roof and walls house the spirit of the people, which then goes on to give more energy for feeding the poor. So we want to do both with spiritual vigor. So he tells this story. I remember a quarrel with one of my wealthier parishioners. She wanted to put a carillon in the steeple. I wanted her to fund the homeless shelter in the building, which housed 150 plus people every night. She refused, and the carillon went in. It cost $10,000. The first night, it played at 5 p.m. At 5.15, I ran into my neighbor, who was the executive director of the methadone clinic next door. She said, the music is so beautiful. It pierces the sky. It's going to help me get through the day. Houses of worship help people of all kinds get through their day. Often we do that by feeding them spiritually. Sometimes we do it by feeding them physically. But there is very little reason not to do both. And he said, I was wrong in my approach to her gift. I was doing the spirit good, money bad thing, that so many social activists have done for so long. We couldn't see the centrality of spiritual hospitality to our ministries. We wanted doing good to be more important than it was. If people are not filled spiritually, they won't be able to do all the good they want to do. Friends, sacred space is important and it helps us on our journey through life. David Banner, in his book, Soulful Spirituality, writes, sometimes I encounter writers and speakers who describe us as human beings on a spiritual journey. And I think that's true, and I've used the same language myself. But I think it is equally true that we are spiritual beings on a human journey. And both journeys are crucial, and each should complement the other. Any religion or spirituality that seeks to make us less than, more than, or other than human is dangerous. Spirituality can and should be in the service of becoming more deeply human. This might surprise you, he writes. After all, the human and spiritual journeys are often presented as diametrically opposed to each other. And so it's quite understandable if you have tended to think of the spiritual journey as helping you move beyond the limitations of humanity. But humanity is not a disease that needs to be cured 
or a state of deficiency from which we need to escape. The spiritual journey is not intended to make us into angels, cherubim, seraphim, gods, or some other sort of spiritual being. It's intended to help us become all that we humans are created to be. So sacred space, friends, helps us in our spiritual journey to become better humans. So we're here either in this place physically or online because we care about each other, about the world, about our journeys to Christ-likeness. And we can't be here in this space 24-7. So how do we create little altars everywhere to remind us of God's presence in our lives? David Adam was one of the uh, writers who encouraged us on our pilgrimage in Wales. We actually got to experience him on one of our bus trips. Uh, he has written a lot of books on Celtic Christianity, mostly prayers and poems. But he invites us to think on the words of Francis Thompson from his poem, The Kingdom of God. A world invisible, we view thee. A world intangible, we touch thee. A world unknowable, we know thee. Inapprehensible, we clutch thee. The angels keep their ancient places. Turn but a stone and start a wing. So he challenges us to find a holy place. And once you have found or made your holy place, he tells us all of a sudden, all things become holy. So where are your thin or holy places? Where do you turn but a stone and start a wing? Thoughts that soar beyond what you can explain and take you instead to a place where God seems vibrant and real. Now, for some of you, it's a place in nature, and you know exactly the spot you would name as your thin place. For others, it's a comfy chair and a favorite blanket at home. Maybe it's the labyrinth behind the church or in the memorial garden. But where does God seem most present to you? In the e-blast this week, there's a secular newspaper article about creating a sacred space in your life. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And there's some su suggestions also on the card that's on your bulletin. But for many Christians, a really good place to start is right here at the altar where we take communion, remembering the human face of God in Jesus Christ, a tangible person who showed us how to love, to live, how to put the common good above his own. So today, let the taste and feel of the bread in your mouth and the juice as you swallow remind you of God's loving presence. Sit quietly and notice everything about the experience of being here in this sacred space. In your awareness is the very presence of God. Receive it with simple gratitude and take the feelings with you. You might feel a prayer forming on your lips or a sense of peace enveloping you. Your experience will be your own. Just today, set your intention on being aware. If it's helpful for you to come up and kneel, feel free to do that as well. But take this experience with you for the rest of the day, guiding you to create time and space where you can intentionally seek God wherever you may be. Because little altars truly are everywhere. And God is just waiting to join you there. Amen.